My name is Robin Pointer, and I'd like to welcome you here on behalf of the director of the School of Art and Art History, Richard Hype, and the director of the Harn Museum, Dr. Rebecca Nagy. Uh, I would like to um, give you a, a welcome to this afternoon's lecture, which is also a memorial. This is part of the Harn Eminent Scholar Chair in Art History lecture series presented by the University of Florida School of Art and Art History and organized by the school's HESCA committee in collaboration with the Samuel P. Harn Museum of Art. Established as a gift by Dr. David and Marianne Coffrin, the HESCA lectures are a series of pres uh, presentations by outstanding art historians, critics, curators, and museum professionals. We are here for a HESCA lecture like none we have sponsored in the past. We're indeed here to hear an eminent scholar talk, but the, at the same time, we're honoring the memory of our esteemed colleague, Barbara Barletta. By inviting a person prominent in Barbara's field to address an important issue in Barbara's discipline. But we've asked that eminent scholar to skew her talk to address not the research that she herself has carried out, but to tell us of the importance of Barbara's uh, research, demonstrating that Barbara herself has indeed been considered an eminence in her own field and has made a significant contribution to art history to classical studies, and to the archaeology of the ancient world. Mike Benford, Barbara's husband, has asked me to make introductions today and to lay out for you the order we will take in our effort to recall Barbara not only as a scholar, but as a friend, a teacher, a mentor, a colleague, and of course, as a sister, aunt, and wife. To do that, we will listen to our guest scholar as she reminds us of the importance of Barbara's scholarly work and show us how it fits into the larger picture of classical studies. Then we will hear several of her friends and colleagues tell of their own relationships with Barbara, how she made an impact on the group with which they worked with her. When we received word that we had lost Barbara, the HESCA committee wanted to honor her memory and decided it was appropriate to do so with such a lecture. Soon after we had made that decision, I saw Marianne Everly, Barbara's colleague from the Classics Department, at a symposium on late antiquity. I asked for her suggestions about who might best speak in honor of Barbara. In an email, she said, after we talked, I realized that Jennifer Niles would be a perfect choice to honor Barbara. She's a prominent scholar. Barbara brought her here as a Harn eminent scholar a few years ago. She works on the Parth Parthenon. She is a Bryn Mawr alum and worked on many American school committees, as did Barbara. Such parallels. And besides, they both had Morgantina connections, and Cambridge University Press published books for both of them. I was convinced and suggested this to the HESCA group. So we welcome Jennifer Niles, the LCB Smith Professor in the Liberal Arts at Case Western Reserve to speak to us. Dr. Niles earned the AB at Bryn Mawr College, where Barbara earned her PhD. She earned the MFA at Princeton University, followed by an MA from Sydney University, and finally by the PhD again from Princeton. At Case Western Reserve, Professor Niles as Barbara did here, teaches classical art and archaeology. She served as guest curator for two major international loan exhibitions, Goddess and Polis, the Panathenaic Festival in ancient Athens, 
and coming of age in ancient Greece, images of childhood from the classical past. She edited and co-authored the catalogs for these two exhibitions. One recent book was The Parthenon Freeze, published by Cambridge University Press. Another was The Parthenon from Antiquity to the Present, also published by Cambridge. She wrote the British Museum Concise Introduction to Greek, Ancient Greek Art, Ancient Greece, and Women on the, in the Ancient World, published by the British Museum and J. Paul Getty Museum. As if carrying out research and teaching is not enough, Dr. Niles has also served as Vice President for Publications of the Archaeological Institute of America and area editor for the seven-volume Oxford Encyclopedia of Ancient Greece and Rome. She has been a visiting professor at the University of California at Berkeley, John Hopkins University, and the American School of Classical Studies at Athens, a resident of the American Academy in Rome, and a fellow at the uh, Getty Research Institute. For six years, she was on the curatorial staff of the Cleveland Museum of Art, where she organized numerous exhibitions and wrote the second volume of its catalog of Greek vases. She's also a field archaeologist and has worked at Tyrone in northern Greece, as well as three sites in Italy. She's currently the chair of the managing committee of the American School of Classical Studies uh, at Athens. Dr. Niles knows the context in which Barbara's work is situated, but she also was a friend of Barbara's. I will let Jennifer Niles share with us her knowledge and perhaps some of her personal memories of Barbara. So please welcome me. Uh, help me to welcome uh, Dr. Jennifer Niles. Her talk is titled Sicily to so Sunion, the Archaeological Life of Dr. Barbara Barletta. Thank you very much, Robin. That was a very warm introduction. And I'm very honored today to speak about a beloved friend and colleague whose passing we all mourn and whose like will not be seen again. I thank her many close friends who send me photos and reminiscences for my talk today. I'm going to begin, this is a first for me, with a brief video clip of the 2015 annual meeting of the American School of Classical Studies at Athens. This meeting um, brings together all the major archaeologists in Greece, as well as uh, major figures like, such as the American ambassador to Greece, the head of the archaeological ministry, and um, also very eminent people. And since Barbara was so beloved and admired by all of us, it was fitting that Barbara's memory was recalled at the opening of the annual American School meeting in Athens last month by its director, Jim Wright. Now just bear with me while I figure this out there. I begin by noting the recent untimely death of our beloved colleague, Professor Barbara Barletta of the University of Florida. Among her many contributions to the study of ancient Greek architecture is her completion of a, the long delayed study begun by Homer Thompson and William Bell Dinsmore Jr. of the Sanctuary of Athena at Sunion, which will soon be published by the school. And I'm happy to say that there's a copy of this book on the table back there, and I hope you all have a look at it. It's a beautiful, beautiful volume, as well as very scholarly. The fans of Barbara are legion, and there are many who would be just as qualified to speak about her many accomplishments in the field of classical art and archaeology, including her colleagues here at the University of Florida, where she was appropriately honored with a University of Florida Research Foundation professorship in 2002. 
But as this photo, I hope, captures, Barbara and I have shared many happy moments at lectures and conferences throughout the United States and Europe, in the field at Morgantina in Sicily, on numerous national committees of the American School of Classical Studies at Athens, where we're shown here in 2003, the American Academy in Rome, um, not to mention various uh, Uzerias and Trattorias in Greece <laughs> and Italy. We've also both served on the board of the Archaeological Institute of America, and we both had our first dig experience when we first put in a trench um, in this beautiful site of Morlo in central Italy, which was a Bryn Mawr College excavation, Etruscan excavation. Now, speaking of Uzo bars, here is Barbara, <laughs> way back in 1983, with her friends and colleagues in Athens, clearly enjoying a taverna dinner outdoors, as we did every summer for decades. We may not recognize the hairdo, <laughs> but we certainly know her famous smile. Given her surname, Barbara seemed predestined to become an authority on the art and architecture of southern Italy. Although the Puglian town of Barletta has no Greek temples or much ancient Greek art to speak of, this region of Italy was colonized by the Greeks in the 7th century BC. And even today, there are still Greek speakers in this region. And appropriately enough, Barbara began her academic career at the University of California at Santa Barbara, <laughs> studying with a very eminent, um, well, it was Italian, but specializing in Etruscan archaeology, Mario Del Chiaro, where she earned her BA in an independent major in ancient history and archaeology. I can, from this view, I can see why she adapted very well to Florida. <laughs> She was originally lured to the East Coast by Bryn Mawr College, which offered one of the most distinguished and one of the few graduate departments of archaeology. Um, you, you may think the faculty there are a bit, you're the extremes of the faculty at Bryn Mawr. Um, <laughs> one of the most eminent archaeologists of Turkey on the left, Matt Melling, I think playing Frisbee. <laughs> and um, a very stern-looking Reese Carpenter, who was one of the great authorities on Greek sculpture. So here she had an array of brilliant professors, many of whom worked in Italy. Barbara wrote her master's <coughs> thesis on an intriguing class of objects that had never been assembled and studied as a single corpus. These are small, portable, terracotta, altars uh, from southern Italy and Sicily, each of which has different figural decoration, as you can see from this variety of them. They're, they're a little bigger than a, a shoebox, between a shoebox and a, and a wine bo box, and they, the top surface was used for making small offerings, usually in households. Um, she noticed East Greek or Ionic parallels for their decoration, and thus began her abiding interest in tracking down and explaining these ionic elements in Sicilian and South Italian art and architecture. Before her groundbreaking work, most scholars believed that the prevailing forms in Greek Italy, this is where the colonists came, starting Greek colonists came, starting back in the 8th century BC, most of them came from what we call Doric cities of mainland Greece, southern mainland Greece, and as a result, everyone was looking for Doric influences. But it was Barbara who first um, got interested in the influences that came from the Greek islands and farther east, mainly the west coast of Turkey, which we call Ionic. <laughs> Closest to Barbara at Bryn Mawr was one whom a colleague once called a Sicilian volcano. <laughs> She was an amazingly dynamic scholar of Greek sculpture. Her name is Brunhilde Sismondo Ridgway. And she set an example for all of us by writing lots of books. Um, hers were mainly on Greek sculpture. Uh, here you see her working on a statue of Heracles in uh, Turkey. Bruni wrote to me um, as follows about Barbara, quote, 
Her specific emphasis on Sicilian architecture came indeed from some of my seminars at Bryn Mawr and took an, at the time, unusual direction, the ionic influence on some basic forms. I encouraged her to travel within the island to see the monuments firsthand. Despite American fears about the mafia <laughs> and other rumors about knife-slinging Sicilians. <laughs> Since my family lived and still lives in Messina, I asked Barbara to go see them. And I know that they drove her to Taormina, where my family was able to get some closed doors open for her. I was concerned that Italians, and who would know better than Bruni, men in particular, would think of her as a typical good-looking blonde, not to be taken seriously as a scholar. And I believe that, to some extent, this drawback followed her most of her earlier archaeological activities. But I was so proud of how much she was able to achieve. Her dissertation was immediately published as a book, and how she continued to refine her architectural knowledge, extending it to other geographical areas." End quote. Now, you probably can't see the page on the right-hand side, page 49 of this particular book, but it's back there and you can look at it. This is where she first began her discussion of Morgantina, which was a sickle. These are the native peoples of Sicily uh, who had a settlement in central Italy, very far from the Greek cities on the coast. But in about the... Uh, sixth century, Greeks came into this area, so Princeton began excavations here. Um, I want to show you a beautiful picture of the site. <laughs> um, this is Mount Etna rising to the east in the background, and in the foreground, the green area is the site of Morgantina. So in about the sixth century, the Greeks actually penetrated into this area, and we start having some Greek pottery and um, some uh, uh, architectural members, as I'll show you in a minute. We lived in the town of Idoni, which is up here, looking down at the site. It was a really very beautiful place. And um, the one problem with this site, however, if you've ever been to Sicily, and I always tell my students that if you want to see the best preserved Greek temples, you have to go to Italy, either <laughs> southern Italy or Sicily. And the unfortunate thing about the Morgantina site is that we don't really have a temple, so no one, it's, no one comes to see us, but um, maybe that's just as well. The only piece of, of temple architecture we have is this block, which is actually a triglyph. It's part of Doric architecture. But we don't have any foundations, columns. Usually that doesn't deter archaeologists from hypothesizing a temple, but anyway. Um, <laughs> We have nothing else to go with this, so it still remains a mystery. But Barbara was, and here's, here's an aerial view of the site, and um, I'm going to, I don't know, can you see the theater? Let's see if I can, yeah, right up here. There's a theater here. This is the later Greek city, it's like fourth century. Um, a pretty big open agora marketplace space there that, we've, that Princeton's been excavating since the 1950s. And Barbara was intrigued by a mysterious set of limestone moldings um, found in fragments under the seats of the theater. Here they are. These are the best pictures I could get of them. Anyway, um, you can see that they're carved limestone pieces. And the original excavators thought that they must have been somehow part of a theater building or the stage building. But Barbara proved conclusively that that was unlikely. She found close parallels in these ionic moldings, which were found on the Greek island of Samos, where their important sanctuary of Hera had a long, long history. Now, I show the moldings found here. You can see that they resemble those of Morgantina. We cannot see them. Pardon me? Oh, what happened? Oh, sorry. <laughs> there they are. You see the you see the similarity here? Okay. 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 And she made, she's the one who recognized 
um, the close similarity between these two. And since those moldings from the sanctuary of Hera came from a stepped large monumental altar, um, rather she decided that the Morgantina fragments too must belong to an altar. And here's a mock-up of the altar at St. Os, so you can see how they kind of fit in. Um, now this, Barber's research on this important discovery, which was awarded a prestigious Deutsches Archaeologisches Institut fellowship in Berlin, uh, will be published in a forthcoming volume of our series, Morgantina Studies, which is published by um, Princeton University Press. So what Barbara did, in effect, was trace a previously unrecognized link between Morgantina, there in the west, and Samos, all the way across the Ionian Sea, the Aegean Sea, to practically Turkey in the east. Today, this approach is called by the trendy term interconnectivity. And younger scholars think they invented it. <laughs> but Barbara was way ahead of them three decades ago. Another link in another area of study which Barbara specialized in was Greek sculpture. And she also saw a link between Sicily and Samos in the area of uh, sculpture, particularly these sixth century male figures known as kuroi. Um, the statue on the left was found in an acropolis of Megara Hiblea in Sicily and is dated stylistically to the mid sixth century. It is of Greek island marble and it was very important with these marble studies have shown us where exactly the marble is coming from. There is no marble in Sicily so it had to come from somewhere uh, in the Greek world. They had not yet discovered marble quarries in, in the continental Italy. So um, Greek island marble uh, was a tip that tip off that this had eastern influences. Barbara cited the East Greek character of this sculpture long before this gigantic koros on the right was found in the sanctuary of Hera at Samos. Both have dedicatory inscriptions on their thighs. I don't think you can probably see that very well, but, um, and the Sicilian example was dedicated by a doctor named Sombrotidas. The amazing thing about Barbara, I think, as a scholar, is that she boldly took on the giants of Greek architectural history, starting with none other than Vitruvius. <laughs> in her second groundbreaking, sorry, in her second groundbreaking book on the origins of Greek architecture that you see on the right, she carefully explained how a mistranslation of Vitruvius by Renaissance writers has led to centuries old misunderstandings of his terminology. So I'll try to explain this. Ever since the Renaissance, we have referred to the distinctive forms of Greek columnar architecture, Doric, Ionic, Corinthian, I show you Ionic here, um, as orders. This is because prominent Italian writers in the Renaissance like Vasari and Alberti translated the term Vitruvius used, the term used was genus, as ordo. Now, genus means type, and it's a more informal term, which doesn't imply a canonical order or a rigidly fixed form. And she explains this appearance of the term ordo as resulting from, and I quote Barbara, Renaissance, especially papal interest, in the more absolute or eternal truths that reflected the divine." End quote. So what Barbara showed is that Vitruvius was writing a handbook for builders um, describing types of architecture that they might use, not canonical order. So it's not a treatise as we've always thought of it as something about architectural aesthetics. And this is very important because it helps explain a lot of the variety we see. Yeah. And this mistranslation, in fact, influenced many modern historians of Greek architecture, the famous ones like William Bell Dinsmore and A.W. Lawrence, 
uh, he, he was T.E. or Lawrence of Arabia's younger brother, who disparaged the architectural achievement of the exuberant and sometimes unorthodox Western Greek temples, um, of which this gigantic temple of Zeus at Agrigento is one spectacular example. So because, in other words, because these didn't follow the rules, the ordo of Vitruvius, they were considered decadent and provincial and everything else. But that's why Barber's work is so important because it shows that in fact, um, we shouldn't take Vitruvius as you know, the last word in how to build Greek temples. Barbara, as we see here, went beyond the text, ancient and modern, to the actual sites to examine firsthand the archaeological evidence. As another, of, as another Greek architectural historian and contemporary of ours, Nancy Klein, has written in her review of Barbara's book. I'll quote this because she said it very well. Our understanding of the origins of the Greek architectural orders is largely based on the writings of Vitruvius and modern interpreters. Archaeological <coughs> evidence has been viewed secondarily and often made to fit into this literary context. Breaking with tradition, Barbara examines, oh sorry, she said Barletta, this is a formal review. Breaking with tradition, Barletta examines the material and written record drawing on a diversity of evidence from early pre-canonical material to the often overlooked contributions of Western Greece and the Cycladic Islands. The result is a fresh, coherent reconstruction of the development of early Greek architecture. And then um, Nancy Klein sums up her analysis of Barber's book as follows, quote, Barletta's formulation of pertinent questions and assessment of the evidence will shape the discussion of the architectural orders for years to come, end quote. And I hardly agree with that. We now move eastwards to Greece proper and the Parthenon. Sorry, that's boring. Because the Parthenon is a building that combines Doric and Ionic elements in unique and novel ways, it naturally fell right into Barbara's area of expertise. So, for a survey book of, on the Parthenon, which Cambridge University Press asked me to organize and edit, I immediately turned to Barbara to provide the chapter on the architecture of the Parthenon and its architects, Ictinus and Callicrates. In her chapter, with its usual thorough treatment of the subject, she politely called into question some of the findings of the chief architect of the Parthenon Restoration Project, which began in 1975 and is still going on, uh, Manolis Caress. But before I show that, let me just sh show you um, the... Uh, <coughs> um, I'm sort of jumping in. Barbara's expertise on the Parthenon came to the attention of WBGH Boston, which made the Nova documentary, The Secrets of the Parthenon in 2008, in which Barbara is a featured authority, and I'll just show you a short clip of that. This is the area of Athens just beyond the Acropolis where male citizens came to vote. We think that during the fifth century, the assembly would have comprised about 30,000, perhaps up to 40,000 male citizens. This, this shows that Barbara could speak about not, not just temples, but all of, all of classical Athens. Now, back to Manolis Caress. As I said, he was the chief architect of the Parthenon Restoration Project. Uh, he's the wild-looking character in the white shirt on the roof of the Parthenon here. He believed that the ionic frieze of the Parthenon this is not the pediments, not the exterior metopes, but inside the colonnade, there's a 524-foot band of relief decoration, um, which is near and dear to my heart because, as Robin mentioned, I did write a book on this. Um, he said that this ionic frieze was an afterthought and tried to prove it by noting that there were certain elements that are called regularly and guta, I'll show them in a minute, on the architraves of the facades. Now, Caress is considered to be a genius, not only by the Greeks, as you might expect, 
but by most archaeologists worldwide. But Barbara, in a, to my mind, definitive article in the American Journal of Archaeology in 2009, entitled, In Defense of the Ionic Frieze of the Parthenon, pointed out that these elements do not continue along the sides. Now, I'll just show you what we're talking about here. <laughs> these little knobs called guti and these little bands called reguli usually appear below a Doric frieze, triglyphs and metopes. And here we have the continual sculpted ionic frieze. Now, these are appear over the porches, but when you get around to the wall side, uh, where the frieze continues along the north and south, we don't get these elements. So that was one argument. Then she said the length and spacing of the blocks, of these frieze blocks, correspond exactly with those on the wall, indicating that it was planned from the beginning. She concludes, quote, Rather than representing a change of design, the prominent combination of Doric and Ionic elements in the Parthenon reflects the ionicization of Attic architecture and its experimentation with new forms in the classical period. So I'm happy that we can lay to rest this theory of choresses that the frieze was an afterthought. Barbara gave, this is a wonderful, very dense article, it shows what architectural historians do in their minute measurements of every block. <laughs> now, we now travel to beautiful Sunian on the southern tip of Attica, right below Athens. You can see it there. Um, I show you the map just to indicate that this is a long, strenuous journey along coastal roads that twist and turn and have hairpins, and it's a long way, even though it doesn't look very long on the map. Um, and the only way to get there if you don't have a car is by bus. The so-called bus schedule can be challenging to say the least. <laughs> um, here you see Barbara and her good friend Molly uh, reflected in the bus schedule <laughs> trying to figure out just how to get back to Athens last summer. So. Why was Barbara going to Sunium, where the major monument is this stunningly located Doric temple of Poseidon, and everyone comes down here at sunset to take the picture of the sun setting beyond the temple. It's a very classic photo. So this is a Doric temple. Well, there was also a temple of Athena out here, and it was Ionic. In fact, the first Ionic temple built in Attica and one of the strangest floor plans ever devised for a Greek temple. Now, these two gentlemen, scholars, the architect, William Bell Dinsmore, the, one of the most famous archi architectural historians of Greece, and the director of the American School Excavations in the Athenian Marketplace, the Agora, Homer Thompson, were the first to study this Ionic temple of Athena, mainly because they were based at Athens, but some of the elements of this temple were actually brought to Athens, columns, capitals, etc., and reused in the Agora in the Roman period. Uh, this so-called itinerant temple, this, seem, this seems weird, but uh, at this period, in the Roman period, these places in the countryside were less inhabited, um, the population was less, and they actually moved, picked up temples, moved them into the city, the marble temples from their foundations to their rooftops. Um, and one example of, just to show you, one of the elements from this temple is a beautiful Ionic capital, which is now in the National Museum in Athens, um, and it preserves a lot of its painted decoration. This is a painted uh, reconstruction of the capital. Sometimes those elements are carved. Um, and painted, in, the, in this instance they were mostly painted and the paints fairly well preserved. <coughs> now what does this temple look like? Well, this is Dinsmore's drawing <laughs> of the reconstructed facade of the temple. It has uh, ten ionic columns across the front. They're kind of distinctive columns, that's why they recognize them in when they were brought in from Athens. Some are still on the site, some are in Athens, but they're not fluted columns, they're plain shafts. Um, so this looks okay, it looks like a lot of temples in 
the east part of Greece, western Turkey, at Miletus, <laughs> Ephesus, Didyma, 10 columns across the front is not uh, normal. But if you look at the weird plan of this temple, those columns don't go all the way around it. They're only on the south and the east. Um, there are no porches, which temples usually have. The cella, the main building, is not centered within this colonnade. It's a very bizarre building. Um, it, it may have something to do with the fact that there are really strong north winds, and um, we think that the altar might actually have been on the south side, and this colonnade provided some kind of protection from the north winds, but that's all very conjectural. Um, now, don't rush down next time you're in Greece to see this building. <laughs> um, this is all that remains on the spot. Uh, some of us fondly call these temples toe-stubbing temples. Um, and if they haven't been cleared of grass and things like that, you can barely see them. But for dedicated archaeologists like Barbara, <laughs> autopsy was all important. She went and measured everything left there, block by block, and took careful notes in spite of the fierce northern winds. The result of her dedication and hard work is the first official publication of this unique temple, something not achieved by either her Greek predecessors who dug the site or by the Americans who first studied it in detail. This book is currently being published by the American School of Classical Studies in the series Ancient Art and Architecture in Context, funded by the J. Paul Getty Trust. And as I said, an advanced copy is here for you to look at. Did I mention Barbara's numerous fellowships, the first of which was the prestigious Rome Prize at the American Academy? At his counterpart in Greece, she was awarded not one, but two NEH senior research fellowships and was a Whitehead visiting professor for 20 of our lucky students. I haven't spoken about Barbara's teaching, but who knows better what a great professor she was than those of you here. Those lucky enough to go on one of her AIA tours or University of Florida student trips know how she could make an ancient site come alive. And here she is performing, <laughs> lecturing in the theater at Suggesta. And here is a brief clip again. And this was a time of soft plays and Euripides performing their wonderful plays to the public in these theaters, including this particular one, the Theater of Dionysus, on the south slope of the Acropolis. Barbara was in her element on site, camera in hand, smiling her beautiful smile with the Greek temple in her sights. In the oft-quoted words of Catullus, Awe, Atque, Wale, Hail, and Farewell. <laughs>